For the last, well, long time, the real-time strategy genre has been more or less stagnant. Most RTSs seek to repeat previous titles, be it StarCraft, Red Alert, or some iteration of a past success. And it's not to say that I don't like RTS. In fact, they are my favorite kind of games. From Brood War to StarCraft 2 to more niche titles like the Furry Up Tooth and Tail, this genre has eaten up more hours than I would like to admit. But sometimes, something different comes around. Something not like other strategy games. Something not about farming minerals, building big armies until someone loses. Something like Company of Heroes 2. As you probably guessed from the title, this is why I love Company of Heroes 2. Company of Heroes is a great game for a lot of reasons, and because of this, I'm going to break this down to a few sections. The gameplay, the aesthetic, the character, and why it's better than other RTS. Keep in mind, this video is about why I really like the game, so my problems will mostly be by the wayside. To get started, let's see how Company of Heroes 2 differs itself from other games in the genre. Traditionally, strategy games see the players building an economy as fast as possible to build an army and crush the enemy. This often involves mining, minerals, and some sort of secondary resource to build soldiers and tech structures, expand to build more bases to generate more minerals, to build more soldiers, etc, etc, until someone loses. Now, no doubt, many of us have watched some sort of RTS esport where the casters attempt to hype up the eco phase, focusing on intense scout micro or praising the efficiency or tech build, or ignoring this altogether and talking about some meta or another. Company of Heroes is not like that, and it's a shame that Ko never grew a larger esports community because there is action since the opening moments of the game. This is mostly due to how resources are collected and victory is achieved. Instead of sending workers to collect resources, units capture points across the map that generate fuel and munitions. They do not, however, generate manpower. The basic soldier buying resource of the game. MP is given to either player at a flat rate, which is reduced depending on how large the army is, in a mechanic called attrition. These mechanics force the players to fight on the map, bleeding for every inch of land in order to keep an advantage in fuel, the resource used in teching, and in vehicle production. The fact that the larger army has less manpower gain means that the player in the lead doesn't snowball too early and allows the player eating shit to come back because they have more manpower to play with, meaning they can take more losses early on in the game. And the requirement to play on the map does not stop right there, because instead of destroying the enemy base, victory is gained by draining the enemy's victory points by holding more, well, victory points. Stars on the map. Once you're at points, you lose. That's simple. This encourages fighting over these three points rather than defending your base until a final assault on the enemy is ready. These changes to the very core of RTS completely shake up the face of war and the gameplay along with it. Another core gameplay mechanic is the abolition of individual units. Instead of building one's marine, the player reduced squads ranging in size between three and seven individuals called models, which is reminiscent of tabletop war games like Memoir 44. In this game, the preservation of units is key, as losing whole squads is far more costly than getting away with a sliver of health on a single model. To give a particular example, the Soviet conscript costs 240 manpower to produce, while each model killed costs 20 manpower to replace. Even beaten within an inch of its life, a single conscript will reinforce back to six models for just 100 manpower. Not only is this simply more cost effective, the unit will also retain what's called veterancy, or just vet for short, meaning the longer the unit lives in fights, the better performs. These mechanics place unit preservation on a pedestal and make each squad feel important, not just numbers. Now, while it is better to have a unit be into one last model rather than killed outright, this still is not optimal. The goal is still to win fights and trade effectively, and Company of Heroes gives a player an immense amount of tactical depth in order to achieve this. From the cover system, multiplying the effective HP of units, to the wide variety of grenades and other special abilities that all squads possess, the tactical depth is like an oceanic trench. Soldiers will throw grenades, toss Molotov cocktails, and launch Panzerfausts, and even modify the battlefield by laying demolition charges, barbed wire, and defensive sandbags. Every option available in the game is outside of the scope of this video, but you can find many options here. 
So now we've gotten all that out of the way, let me step back for a sec, because up to this point I've only focused on infantry, but that ignores the main strategy of the game, combined arms. Excellence in this game cannot be achieved by microing infantry alone, although it's a good skill to have. True generals will make use of what we call team weapons. These are anti-tank guns, machine guns, and mortars, along with other faction-specific weapons. By positioning these weapons well, you can lock down parts of the map, bombard static emplacements, lay smoke for an advancing army, and stop vehicles dead in their tracks. And speaking of combined arms, we've come to the part of the video where we must talk about tanks. Vehicles add yet another layer of complexity to the game, from ultralight scout cars that simply provide a firing platform and an extra machine gun, to the Panzer II Lux, or T-70, that provide excellent anti-infantry armor to break through machine gun emplacements. Medium tanks are more heavily armored with better anti-tank guns, and the iconic heavy tanks reprise their roles as monsters on the battle, from the IS-2 and Tiger acquiring heavy anti-tank counters or else they take over the game. And yet, even with big cats roaming the battlefield, infantry still keeps purpose. From infantry with anti-tank guns like the PTRS and Panzer Shrek, to AT grenades that can destroy the engine of any vehicle, infantry with other weapons and tanks, again combined arms, can defeat any foe. With every unit in the game having some kind of ability, the importance of cover, and commanders that alter the options available to it, any army, every game is different, and with a territory system forcing players to constantly fight, every battle is tense. And even beyond these gameplay abstractions, the gameplay mechanics, the importance of units, are further enforced by the game's aesthetic. World War II is truly the correct era for this sort of game, giving enough technology as to have incredible spectacles of tanks exploding in artillery barrages, but not enough to rely on long-range missiles and close air support. And the game even sounds as tense as it feels. Gunfire is loud. PPSHs can be heard across the map. Mortars have that distinct whistle and Stukas even have their telltale siren. Troops can hear vehicles through the fog of war as their heavy engines roll across the terrain. 50 cal sound heavy, grenades have a really impactful explosion, and tank guns sound powerful. And these design elements even help players micro their units. I can hear a tank coming to move my AT gun, I can hear a mortar coming down so I know to dodge it, and I always know when my shock troops are in combat. And the best part of this design, in my opinion, are the voice lines on every single unit. Soldiers will tell you when they're suppressed. I HATE MACHINE GUNS! Soldiers will tell you when they're under fire. The enemy! The enemy has found us! And they'll even go as far as to tell you when grenades are at their feet. I am getting tired of this shit! So you can get out of the way. And let's face it, a lot of these voice lines are just fun. I mean, come on, listen to this. Our PPSHs are here. Now even Yuri can hit something. What the hell are you doing? TAKE THAT FUCKING POINT! I would rather be shooting at the enemy. And so all these elements come together to create a soundscape that just sounds like a really intense war. And by actually aiding the player's micro, this is the only RTS that I play with my sound on. And at the end of the day, everything comes together to create the only RTS that feels like a movie. Having the drama, the suspense, the action as a unit clings to cover, hoping to fight another day. And this drama, unique to this game, is why I love Company of Heroes 2. Now let me leave you with the ambiance of an intense mid-fight, and if you want to hit the 10 minute mark.